talking to you all. It's, it's really nice to again see you all stay in good health and safe. Today, I would like to welcome all of you to the Global Mercury Partnership Waste Management Area Information Sharing Session on Mercury Waste Treatment, Knowledge and Technology, which is part of a series of online events organized by the Global Mercury Partnership and many thanks all for all of you for your precious time to join our event today. And I would like to express sincere gratitude to our distinguished panelists, as well as the leads of the Mercury Waste Management Area of the Partnership, Dr. Misusu Asari from the Kyoto University and Ms. Junko Nishikawa from Ministry of Environment Japan and to newly established uh, partnership area working group two on capacity building and awareness lessing and its colleagues uh, Immaculate uh, Javier from Sustainable uh, Aruvia Mining Service and Len uh, Reinhard uh, Schmidt from Econ Industry for bringing us together today on this important topic for the implementation of the Minamata Convention. We have the chance to have today expert panelists from various fields and backgrounds who will be sharing information on the environment, tourism management of mercury wastes, providing in session one on overview of existing two guidance and work in the context of partnership area, as well as in session two, an overview of technology for dealing with mercury waste with example from different regions of the world. I would like to encourage all participants today to make this opportunity to discuss and exchange with mercury waste management experts who are with us today. And I look forward to the presentation and discussion and wish all successful and enjoyable meeting. Over to you, Mrs. So. Okay, thank you very much. Yeah, so uh, I want to uh, open the, the first session. Um, so again, I want to uh, invite the first speaker, uh, Junko Nishikawa, Junko-san. Uh, Junko Sam links 20 years of experiences in policy development and the project management in Japan and abroad, with a special focus on uh, waste and chemical management. In Ministry of the Environment Japan, uh, he played uh, active, very important roles in international policy making processes under the Basel Convention and the Montreal uh, Protocol, and managed many projects, especially in Asia and the Pacific region. Her wide experience in developed as, uh, assistance includes works at the World Bank, United Nations University, and JICA Environmental Policy Advisor for Myanmar. So Junko-san holds a Master of International Affairs and uh, Sustainable Development and a Master of Science in Ecology. And uh, I'm really happy to invite her because I, well, I'm uh, the old friends with Junko-san. So Junko-san, um, yeah, please start your presentation. Thank you very much, Dr. Asari. So let me share the screen. And also as a co-lead of the waste management area of the Global Mercury Partnership, I would like to thank everyone who kindly takes the time to join in this webinar. And um, yeah, I'm very happy to join as well. So from me, oh, let me see whether it is coming. Can you see the slides? Coming, yes. Maybe we have to wait a moment. But... Okay. Yeah, so from yeah, my good. side, I, while waiting, from my side, I'd like right to introduce the overview of the tools and guidance which has been developed so far by this waste management areas. Um, yeah. So the first one is a snapshot of the of this waste management area. 
so which was established in 2008. So we have over 10 years or 20 years, sorry, over 15 years working experience with the objective to promote the environmental sound management of mercury waste by disseminating relevant materials, enhancing capacity and awareness and providing specific solutions at all levels. So the, the, this area is led by Dr. Asari, the, the facilitator of this webinar, together with the Ministry of the Environment of Japan, which I belong to. And we have over 100 partners participating in, in this area with a balanced uh, combination of the organization as well as the region. So we have uh, plenty of NGOs participating as well as the government and industry uh, stakeholders. And this is a planned activity of the waste management area for the upcoming three years. So we recently established the three working groups and each of them will undertake activities while maximizing synergy to promote the market waste management. And the working group one focus on the resource development. And we can, we can hear more information on, this, on the activity of the working groups by Nicholas after me. So I will skip this. And for the working group two, which is focusing on the capacity building and awareness raising. And this webinar is actually one of the outreach event, which is organized by this working group two. And working group three is focusing on the solution exchange. And we try to develop some solution exchange platforms so that we can provide on the ground um, uh, we to, to, to meet the on, ground, on the ground needs and demand, in, especially in the developing countries, and try to make a matchmaking between the solution providers and the, and the demands of the material waste management. So we will hear more updates from each working groups as we work. And also we will share the information through the secretariat so that you can hear more on this later on. So one of the first outreach, sorry, one of the first output tools of this working group or of this waste management area is the catalogs of technology and services on mercury waste management, which is already on the website of the UNEP secretariat. So you can see that and the catalog contains mercury waste management technologies and services by 12 partners of the areas. And in, for each area, for, sorry, for each technologies, we have one pages to, to summarize the profile, overview of the technology, strengthening and advantage and applicability. So you can get the quick information of the, what kind of technology is available and who is providing those technologies. And currently we are discussing to update this catalog so that to make it more user friendly. And uh, once update is available, we are also sharing the information through the website as well as uh, the, with the mailing list. So at the moment we have 12 technologies in the list in, of the catalogs. And yeah, we are trying to uh, updates the catalog with more technology and services and possible digitalization and mapping of those technologies. And working group one is working on this. And second output document is uh, technical guidelines on the market waste under the Basel Convention. So as you know, the Minamata Convention requires parties to manage market waste in an environmental sound manner, taking into account the guidelines developed under the Basel Convention. And this technical guideline on the market waste has been developed more than 10 years ago, as long as I remember. But now we are in the process to update the guidelines to make it consistent with the requirement of the Minamata Convention as well. So Basel Convention established the small intersessional working groups to assist the update, and Japan is taking the lead on this activity. 
And now we are developing the updated version of the guideline, which is already on the website of the Basel Convention Secretariat, and try to make it considered as the next OEWG and also possible adopt adoption of the COP15 of the Basel Convention. So hopefully by June this year, we have uh, updated guidelines and then the guidelines can be shared to the to the parties of the both conventions so that they, you can you can make a reference on that. So the the characteristics of the guidelines, of course, which talks about how to in, ensure the environmental sound management of the waste itself, but at the same time, which at the same time, the guidelines highlights the importance of the life cycle approach. So that how to minimize the mercury going into the waste stream. So as shown in the uh, in, uh, in the graph in a, in a figure here, we try to address the each process of the life cycle. So that what what need to be considered and what need to be done in each phase of the mercury flow. And this is uh, the table of content or kind of structure of the guidelines, and uh, which covers both mercury waste categorized hazardous waste under the Basel Convention, as well as the mercury waste defined under the Minamata Convention. And the guidelines covers from the legal framework, inventory, sampling, prevention, minimization to the environmental sound disposal. And if you are interested in, uh, the, the draft guidelines updated, and sorry, draft guide, guidelines uh, available on the Brazil Secretariat, Brazil Convention Secretariat. So we are happy to, you are happy to look at that and, and then more information, more update on the adoption of the guideline will come later. So thank you very much. This is my presentation. Thank you very much, Junko san. So uh, I want to um, maybe um, if we have time, maybe we can do that Q and session. But I think it's better to go ahead. So uh, can I introduce the next presenter? So Nicolas san, are you ready? So Nicolas uh, Hummet holds a PhD in chemistry with 25 years of experiences in hazardous waste management in different positions. R&D, Operations and Public Affairs. He gets um, a transversal and com comprehensive overview of this sector in Europe and worldwide. So Nicolas San has been involved in the market waste issues for a very long time. He follows the Minamata Convention. He's part of the, uh, he's part of the expert working group, uh, the, defi uh, the uh, definition of the market waste specials referred to in Article 11 of Convention, and he is member of a small international working group on a revision of the technical guideline on ESM of environmental waste. So Nicolas San is a member of the Global Market Partnership Waste Management Area, uh, representing the International Solid Waste Association, ISWA, as chair of the hazardous waste working groups. Yeah, so he's my hero. So Nicolas Stan, uh, can you start your presentation? Yes, thank you very much, uh, Mizuzu. I will, okay. Uh, so Imelda, you share your screen finally, okay? Right? Thank you. Yes, I can, I can yes, share my yes. screen. Okay, okay, no problem. <laughs> Um, so just uh, to, um, before starting on, on the specific uh, issue, uh, I would like to share with you regarding the, the development of fact sheet on environmentally sound management of mercury waste. Uh, just a few words about ISVA. So ISVA is the world leading network promoting professional and sustainable uh, waste and resource management. Um, RISVA represents all uh, uh, type of, of stakeholders within the waste management sector, the public sector, the private sector, and also the academic. Uh, ISVA is represented by more than uh, 1,300 members in uh, 109 uh, countries. So 
I can say that ISVA is a, a unique global network on, on waste management in general. So thank you, Imelda. Uh, first of all, the context of, of this um, of this project uh, within the, the uh, working group run of the Global Mercury Partnership Waste Management Area. Um, <clears throat> so as uh, also it was said by Junko, um, we have on the table this revision of the technical guideline on, on the environmentally sound management of, of mercury waste, which is a very good uh, and accurate document uh, technically, but under certain circumstances, I would say that it's not always uh, practical to, to be used by, by all kinds of people who will need uh, to find uh, information and, and how to deal with certain kind of, um, uh, of mercury waste. And it appears at, at a con as a concern uh, from developing countries. We had this discussion within, uh, within the Hazardous Waste Working Group of HISVA from, from our colleague, which are um, in developing countries. And yes, we, we have those, uh, those very good documents, but uh, sometimes it's difficult to use them and to really know um, um, on, on, on the entire uh, management chain how to deal with certain kind of, um, of mercury waste. So we also uh, found the, the same concern in the uh, survey that was provided by the, the Global Mercury Partnership uh, last year. Um, so the idea uh, was to, to try to provide uh, uh, a practical and comprehensive answer uh, on, on specific um, mercury waste streams, uh, those who are considered as the most relevant or the, the, uh, the most important for all stakeholders and specifically for developing countries. And this uh, should be based on, on fact sheet. So Melda, next, thank you. Um, the organization first, so as I said, uh, we, we, have, we made this, um, this uh, outcome uh, within the Hazardous Waste Working Group of, of ISVA and we decided to say, okay, we, we need to, to dedicate a, 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 a small team uh, with experts within the working group to, to deal with that, uh, with that issue. And uh, we also, uh, um, as, as I'm part of the Global Mercury Partnership, um, I also <clears throat> see this, that is also a concern uh, uh, through the Global Mercury Partnership uh, survey that has been provided last year. So the idea was to, to try to join forces of the different experts and, and to have a sort of co-authoring of uh, the fact sheets. So this is a bit the, the idea and the organization. We will have, in fact, experts from the Azadus West Working Group of ISVA and some others uh, from uh, uh, the Working Group 1 of the Global Mercury Partnership Waste Management Area, and we will work together uh, in order to, um, to uh, draft uh, the fact sheet and, and to, um, to look at the different uh, mercury waste streams on which there is a real need uh, to uh, provide those fact sheets. Next, please. Um, first of all, we have a, a roadmap to do so, and uh, this roadmap is also um, a, a, a short paper uh, where we explain exactly uh, what we intend to do. And this roadmap is divided in, in four steps. For the first one, which is the most important, I would say, is uh, to define the list of priority mercury waste uh, based on certain criteria. So first of all, the, the, we, we, for, for defining the mercury waste, we, we decided to use the, what I call here the Minamata list, which is in fact uh, the, um, the, the, the list um, uh, that has been adopted in, a, in the decision by, by the third COP uh, to the Minamata Convention. And uh, the different criteria uh, which can be used in order to, to define this list of priority mercury waste uh, can be, for instance, uh, the lack of operational information about uh, certain mercury waste streams, uh, the technical complexity for uh, an environmentally sound management of, of those uh, streams, uh, the high risk of mercury releases or emission uh, through the, the waste management. So this kind of criteria are used in order to define the, the priority list. The second step <clears throat> um, consists in uh, uh, drafting the template of the fact sheet, what, what we, we need to give and to provide uh, as information. So this is a bit the headlines of, of the fact sheets. Um, the step three is really the drafting of 
a fact sheet on the top one priority um, of, uh, on the list of waste streams uh, that would, will be defined. And the final step will be the validation of the fact sheet. Um, uh, and this validation will, will go through the Global Mercury Partnership and uh, hopefully we will have the help and the, and the, the scrutiny from, um, uh, from the Minamata, uh, Minamata Secret Convention Secretariat and, and potentially from the Basel Convention uh, also Secretariat. And then to communicate uh, uh, about those fact sheets, um, we can have two folds on that. Uh, a first um, chain of con co communication can be through uh, the ISVA network, which is, uh, as you, uh, you know now, very, uh, very, <clears throat> very extensive. And we can really uh, dedicate communication to developing countries because we have also regional network uh, in Latin America, for example, or in Asia. And we have also um, uh, members, but there is no uh, specific network for the moment in Africa. So we can really uh, uh, disseminate uh, the, uh, the information. And of course, through uh, the uh, Global Mercury uh, Partnership, because it will be one of the tax tasks of the working group one to define a uh, certain point of the communication and specifically <clears throat> see uh, which language uh, languages are necessary to uh, to disseminate the uh, the fact sheet and also to see if uh, some some training training package can be developed on on the fact sheet so the objective for the moment is to um, finalize step 1 and 2 by mid march uh, this year and um, and uh, we have two meetings uh, in in fact in end of February and, and beginning of March uh, with the, the joint uh, working group in order to uh, finalize those two steps. Next, please. So the, the draft fact sheet templates, we already have um, a bit of an idea of what uh, should be the, the headlines of, of this uh, template an introduction for sure, uh, where we will uh, describe uh, the, uh, the waste streams in question. Uh, we will also <clears throat> provide some facts and figures, uh, the occurrence and these kind of things about the, 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 the mercury waste, uh, what are the risks, and um, also the links to, uh, to the re relevant legislation uh, already existing. A second point regarding the classification of the waste stream, um, where we can also uh, uh, make relation with the, the, the Basel Convention uh, annex, uh, annexes, and also with other uh, regional uh, legislation where we have some a kind of uh, classification for the different kind of mercury waste. Um, the, the best practices in terms of collection of the different uh, waste streams. Um, the, the question about packaging, labeling, and transport, which are very important points in order to, uh, to provide a, a really accurate and safe uh, management of, uh, of this, uh, uh, of this uh, interim uh, services we, we should provide for uh, environmental sound management of mercury waste. How to store uh, the, those uh, those mercury waste? What are the best practices? And this should uh, include. This is a point we discussed um, last time. Uh, cases of accident or leakage or spillage, and how to to take care about those uh, those issues. And finally, the environmental management or treatment of of the different mercury waste, from pre-treatment uh, to uh, final treatment. And this can be a uh, a very long list of different kind of uh, steps <clears throat> and we, it, it will really depend on uh, the, the waste stream we are looking at in the, in the different fact sheet. Next slide, please. Um, the priority list of mercury waste, um, very important also. Uh, the discussion is in progress as it is noticed here. It's not finalized yet, but if um, we, we look at uh, uh, what, uh, what was the outcome of the, of the survey from the Global Mercury Partnership, we found some, some hints here, uh, some evidences of uh, certain waste that uh, appears to be very, very important in, ter in terms of developing the fact sheet. So uh, if I look at the, the three categories uh, that have been decided in the or listed in the decision uh, adopted at the search cop of the to the Minamata Convention. So in category A, uh, the uh, the 
the way stream that appear very evident is uh, to look at the elemental mercury from different sources. In category B, B um, four uh, waste streams appears, appear, so the fluorescent bulb, uh, the non-electronic measuring uh, devices, dental amalgam, and batteries and accumulators. And for category C, um, the, the, the top one is uh, tailings uh, from ASGM, and there are also possibilities to look at uh, the waste contaminated with mercury or mercury compounds from uh, manu other manufacturing processes. And here we can have some, some links uh, with other areas in the global mercury partnership, for example, the, the oil and gas or the non-ferrous metals uh, production and these kind of things. Uh, and I think that this is the end for me. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you very much, Nicholas. And um, I think uh, I mean, the audience has many questions, uh, but uh, uh, the time is coming. So, yeah. if you have any questions, please uh, put uh, input on the chat field. Uh, then maybe we can reply in possible uh, styles. So then uh, I have sorry. <laughs> so now Kiona slide is here, but uh, yeah. Input in the chat field, and then I have to hand over to next session, session two. Uh, to sorry, I yeah, yeah. Uh, session two. Uh, the MC is uh, Immaculate Sun. So, can you start the next session? BSM, please uh, manage the second session, awesome. session two. Thank you, uh, Asari, and um, thanks to all the organizers of the webinar, the UNEP GMP and the WMA secretariats. Good morning, good evening, and good night to you all. Uh, this session will look into technologies for solutions on environmentally sound mercury waste management that might be beneficial to stakeholders. The present, presenters presenting in this session um, will have, have more than 20 years of experience in their specialties and will explain to us uh, some of the state of art technologies they use in their companies, including presentations of some case studies. So, I hope you all uh, enjoy these presentations and participate. I will introduce each speaker as we go through each each presentation. If we have time at the end of each uh, presentation, we will get probably one or two questions. Otherwise, we can get questions at the end of all the presentations. So you can also type in the chat. Let me introduce our first uh, presenter. Our first presenter will be Reynard Shemid. And uh, Reynard will talk about mercury waste technologies and case studies for the oil and gas and chloroalkali sectors. Uh, Reynard has 25 years of experience in managing industrial wastes. He is a graduate engineer for mechanical engineering based in Munich, Germany, and founded Econ Industries in 2003 with the goal of avoiding incineration and landfilling by engineering recycling plants for hazardous uh, industrial waste. To this day, he continues to lead the company's global operations as the CEO. He's vision is that every country in the world must have access to state-of-art technology to treat its own industrial wastes locally. Exported incineration and landfilling of waste shall be reduced significantly. So I'll uh, give the floor over to Reina to uh, present. Thank you. Thank you very much, Immaculate, for your 
introduction. Um, welcome to all participants worldwide. Um, yeah, treating mercury waste is um, in terms of uh, the industrial sector and treating mercury waste is that are coming from the industrial sector. This is our uh, presentation for today here. Um, I'm focusing on the oil and gas sector as well as the chlor alkali sector because according to our experience this is these are the two sectors from the industrial waste generation where most of the knowledge is um, already occurred from and um, where there is already a long track record of treating such wastes from the mining sector including um, the ASGM sector this is a little bit still in the beginning so but um, please keep in mind in this presentation that all the experience that it has been made in the oil and gas and chloralkali sector will be um, helping the mining sector in the next years to overcome the difficulties that occur there with the mercury wastes also so as you can see here in the beginning slide we are talking about contaminated soils, we are talking about contaminated sludges, byproducts like catalysts and activated carbon, construction debris, um, so construction waste mainly from the oil, from the chloracali site, um, drilling waste is from the oil and gas industry, and last but not least, the pure elemental mercury that mainly occurred in these two sectors in the oil chloracali sites. So these are the wastes that we are talking about here. So if you meet these wastes in your daily business, um, and then it's the right moment um, to, to keep an eye on this. Next page, please. Yeah. Um, why do we want to focus on local treatment of mercury wastes? We believe that it is really important to say that the Basel Convention should control the transport boundary movement of the hazardous wastes and their disposal um, as best as it can. But we have our own convention and we call it internally Basel 2.0. Um, we believe it's, it's uh, quite helpful um, to avoid the transboundary movements of hazardous wastes and their disposal. So that countries take over responsibility of their own wastes. And last but not least, we are also convinced that this is saving money. Next, please. So the benefits of a local treatment of mercury wastes and the case studies that you see later on is the increase of, of, of know-how around how to treat mercury wastes um, there's an added value because when you can treat mercury wastes, you will also be able to deal with other hazardous wastes in your countries. Um, it generates qualified jobs, um, creates an independence from international transports like uh, transport crisis that we recently experienced in the pandemic um, is of course an issue when you want to treat uh, transport wastes. And um, it delivers a lot of transparency when, do you, when you do it in country. Um, you decrease expenses um, because uh, as per our experience, local treatment of such wastes is cheaper. Um, it uh, decreases the dependence on external transport and it of course avoids transport hazards and emissions. When you don't transport, you don't have hazards and emissions. And uh, the export bureaucracy is, of course, a kind of nightmare um, around the hazardous wastes, and um, sometimes it takes like one and a half, two years or more um, to get the transport on the way. So when you have facilities locally, of course, um, you can use them um, at any time. Next, please. So wastes that we are typically talking about here are soils and sludges contaminated with elemental mercury and the case studies that I will show are the, the vacuum distillation units that we are using 
for these kinds of wastes. Um, they work at low temperature below 400 degrees under vacuum. Um, we are talking about spent catalysts and activated carbon um, contaminated mainly with mercury compounds. They need high temperature around 1000 degrees Celsius. And we are talking about pure elemental mercury, um, its conversion to HGS for final disposal. Um, next, please. So this is uh, the vacuum dry technology is a vacuum distillation process, um, which is uh, used to separate the mercury from the solids. And um, this is why it is very useful for larger amounts of wastes, like contaminated soils, building rubble, landfills, etc. So especially when it comes to uh, to uh, contaminated sites. Um, we just uh, recently cleaned up a mercury uh, thermometer factory. Um, then this technology is quite useful on site. Next, please. So it's a, basically, it's a, it's a process where you put the waste inside a dryer chamber, heat the material up, and uh, evaporate the contaminants so that you can recover the mercury or also the oil if it exists and get out clean solids and of course the separated mercury friction. Next. So such equipment is available in, in mobile units. Um, nowadays we just recently designed and will deliver such a mobile unit. Um, we have an own unit uh, as a rental option where we test it currently in, in different countries. But um, this is the first ever, um, I would say, skid mounted mobile mercury waste treatment facility um, with a capacity starting with uh, five tons per day. So this one that you can see here is a smaller one. Talking about um, such units, um, I display here the account uh, expenses you will have when you treat. Um, with this technology, we are talking about a range of uh, 30 to 150 euro per ton for capital expenses. And uh, the operational expenses are in an area of, uh, let's say, 50 euro plus um, when it comes to energy consumption and uh, other expenses. You need operators for this, but usually you work on site where some operations already exist. So this is the framework we are talking about when we are treating soils and sludges contaminated with elemental mercury. Next. This picture shows such a unit uh, with a capacity of 10 tons per day that has been delivered like three years ago um, to Western Australia, to the wastes that occur there in the gas drilling and in the gas exploration. So uh, it's this kind of vacuum distillation process and this, uh, the wastes are mainly sludges from pipelines and also from, from tanks. So this is typically um, a unit looking like this has a, has a small footprint like a 20 foot container, um, a little bit auxiliary equipment feeding discharge, um, but that's basically the size of the equipment. Next. This is a unit that we just uh, one year ago put in operation in India in Kodai Canal, um, where a cleanup of a thermometer factory has to take place. And um, it is a semi mobile unit. It will operate there for around three years. And it, it is operated 2,200 meters high on a mountain. So it was, of course, challenging to get the equipment there, but the advantage is afterwards that you don't have to transport the soils um, from the mountain down to, uh, let's say, another treatment facility or for export. Um, in total, we are dealing there with more than 10,000 tons of contaminated soils on site, and they will be totally cleaned. And later on, only the elemental mercury will be packed and finally disposed. Next. So these are just, this have been 
two examples of uh, what we have done in the past um, with mercury wastes. Um, we have units in operation in, in Germany, as I said, in Australia recently. We also delivered to Brunei a unit, which is not yet in operation due to the, the pan pandemic uh, problems. And um, yeah, um, there are many units uh, in the world uh, dealing with from five to 500 tons per day. Next, please. As I said before, for um, some material, you need higher temperature, and therefore we can use high temperature treatment units, um, a process uh, that is operated um, under temperatures up to 1,000 degrees. Um, next, please. Um, one example for for it is this planet plant here in Australia also where locally spent catalysts spent activated carbon are treated um, in a quite a compact um, centralized treatment facility um, you see here it's not much space that you need to operate such equipment properly next please yeah um, one of these facilities, as I said, is based in, in Australia, one other is in Europe. Um, this is available with uh, throughput capacity starting from 100 kg per day um, up to, I would say, infinite. Um, therefore, uh, that it's a, it's a proven process, um, even in, in smaller scale. Next. Yeah, and last but not least, we are coming to the stabilization of the mercury, so the um, mercury conversion to mercury sulfide. Um, this is the aim to finally dispose the mercury sulfide, um, especially in, in Europe, they go to underground salt mines with the stabilized mercury. Um, this is possible in smaller and larger mobile units. And um, the output material I can show you here um, is finally looking like this. This is mercury sulfide, quite heavy material, of course, with density of around five, but um, it is uh, no more leachable, the mercury in this stabilized material, and also the emissions are below 10 microgram per cubic meter. So um, it is, uh, as per the requirements of the disposal facility, um, emission-free. Um, what we actually do here, we add sulfur to the mercury and st stabilize in a chemical process the material to this consistency. Next, please. Yeah, this can be done in smaller units of around 200 kg per day. Um, mm -hmm. As you can see here, this is a reactor um, where you have a working volume of around 100 liters, and um, you don't need more. This is the plant size. Um, of course, uh, you have a kind of activated carbon filter laid on um, for the cleaning of the, of the exhaust, but um, it's not really a large plant. Um, footprint, um, including the heating, syst heating system, is around uh, 20 foot container size. And so it's quite compact and skip mounted mobile. Next, please. Yeah, this is the other end of the performance uh, range, I would say. This is a large unit um, that we operated at Chloracala facilities in Europe with a capacity of five tons per day. Um, it is a 40 foot container size, this kit, and working according to the same principle. The elemental sulfur is put into the reactor, the elemental mercury is injected, and finally you end up with mercury sulfide, and it gets stabilized. Um, you can uh, put it into drums, and safely transport it because the mercury is no longer leachable and also emissions, mercury emissions do not occur from this mercury sulfide. Yeah, so this is the, the range of, of applications and uh, projects that we have done. Next step, please. The 
important point is that with the mercury conversion, we also believe it is good to do it on site um, because um, when you have packed the mercury locally, um, it occurs as mercury sulfide and then you can s decide locally if you find a local disposal facility, for example, in an old mining facility, or if you pack it and ship it in drums to Europe for final disposal directly at the at the salt mines. Um, it is of course um, the safer way to transport the mercury sulfate than transporting the elemental mercury. And also from the packing point of view, it's of course much easier. Um, quite compact design, um, the, the units can be moved. So if one project is finished because um, the legacy has been um, finished on site, you can move it to another place. So it's not necessary to move the mercury to where the unit stands. You can also you move the unit to where the mercury is. Next, please. Yeah, um, I have mainly shown here larger case studies with bigger plants. Um, we have uh, here now um, the very large ones with capacities of 50 tons, 100 tons and more per day. Um, units that can deal with uh, mercury wastes, but also oily wastes, um, for example, from the oil and gas industry. Um, for us, from the design point of view, it makes no difference. If you treat mercury inside such a plant or oily wastes, you can move from the one day to the other in your operation process. Next, please. Yeah, um, if you do want to treat mercury wastes, ask our team. We are all enthusiastic about what we do because um, as we say, it's not rocket science um, dealing with mercury wastes. Thank you very much for the moment. Yeah, and I give back to Immaculate for, for further um, handling of this section here. Thank you. Wow. Thank you, Reynard. Interesting. Good work done by you. Um, we'll go to our next speaker. Maybe we are catching up on time now, so we'll just go straight. And if you have any questions, please include in the chat. Our next speaker is um, Yuroki Iwase. Yuroki will be presenting on examples of technologies and international cooperation with stakeholders for ensuring the environmental sound management of mercury containing lamps. Um, a brief introduction of uh, Mr. Iwase. Hiroki is the sales department manager at Nomura Kosan Limited, a Japanese company specialized in the management and disposal of mercury wastes. He has experience in mercury waste collection in Japan and import of mercury waste, and amongst others, conducted a feasibility study focusing on fluorescent lamps. Uh, sifo manometers, thermometers, and sludges contaminated with mercury in the Philippines. Um, you was said the floor is yours. For the introduction, uh, great. Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, everyone. My name is Hiroki Wase from Nomurako san. I'm very happy to hear. Uh, and I'm pleased to present you uh, our, our mercury waste management technology. Next, please. Here is the outline of my presentation today, the overview of Nomura Kosan and treatment process and examples of international cooperation. I have two uh, examples in the Philippines and Malaysia. Next, please. So, oh, let's start uh, with first topic of uh, overview of normal cosan. 
Nomura Kosan was established in 1973 in order to treat mercury waste in sound manner. Uh, before treating mercury waste business, uh, our main business was mercury mining from 1939 to 1973. Due to the Minamata disease, the demand for mercury declined. In 1973, we stopped mercury uh, mining and redirected the business toward recycling mercury based on the refining technology developed through mining. Nomura Kosan has, uh, since then, uh, Nomura Kosan has been treating mercury waste for about 50 years in Japan. Our head office is in Tokyo and we have two mercury waste management facilities. One is Itomuka plant in Hokkaido, northern part of area in Japan, and a Kansai factory in Osaka. Next, please. Tomuka uh, is, uh, used to be a mercury mine site, uh, and Itomuka means sparkling water, uh, which means mercury. In Itomuka, uh, we treat any kind of mercury waste, includes dry cell batteries, fluorescent lamps, mercury itself, uh, activated carbon catalyst, thermometer, sphygmo manometer, and so on. And Kansai factory is a pre-treatment facility for fluorescent lamps. In Kansai plant, we recover mercury sludge from lamps and then the sludge is sent to, to Itomuka plant. Next, please. This is our track record in 2020. We treated a total of 33,400 tons of mercury waste in 2020. Almost a half of the total waste comes from dry cell batteries, which comprises 16,700 tons. Next is fluorescent lamps, which account for 9,000 tons. The rest includes other types of mercury waste, such as contaminated soil and sludge, manometer, uh, and so on. Next, please. Next, please. Uh, I'd like to explain uh, our uh, roasting uh, processing process. We treat mercury waste and recover mercury by roasting process. This process heats the mercury waste at a temperature about 600 degrees Celsius to 800 degrees Celsius, which causes the mercury to evaporate. Vaporized mercury is collected through the cooling process. The photo is our roasting furnace, the Herschel furnace, which has six floors and the mercury waste is sent from top floor and goes down to lower floor. After roasting, after recover uh, mercury from the mercury waste, the residue is disposed in leachate control landfill site in Itomuka. Next, please. I would like to introduce uh, our uh, fluorescent lamp uh, treatment floor. We also use the roasting process to correct mercury from fluorescent lamps. This is the processing floor of fluorescent lamps in, in Itomuka. After the crushing and separating process, the glass fragments of fluorescent lamps are washed 
with the water to remove the mercury that has come into contact with the fragment. The washing water is collected as mercury containing sludge and is processed in the Herschel furnace to recover the mercury. The mercury then goes through the process I have mentioned in the previous slide. Fluorescent lamp parts are recycled and distributed as mercury, grass card for lamps, fiber, grass, and aluminum. In addition, the fluorescent powder that coat the lamps contains rare earth. After the mercury is extracted from the fluorescent powder, the powder is sold as rare earth material. As such, almost 100% of the waste of fluorescent lamps can be recycled and reused as new material. As I said in earlier slide, Kansai factory is the intermediate facility for fluorescent lamps. The processing floor of the Kansai factory is in the red, fra red frame on the slide. In order to reduction of the volume sent to Itomuka, the lamps are crushed and washed at the Kansai plant. After those treatment, we collect the mercury containing sludge and we send the sludge packed in drums to the Tomuka plant. Next, please. Lastly, I'd like to introduce two examples of international cooperation. First example is for the Philippines. From 2014 to 2016, we conducted training about correcting and crushing used fluorescent lamps in Japan and the Philippines. In Japan, the delegation from the Philippines visited Itomuka plant. In the Philippines, we visited the two local companies where the lamp crusher installed and gave the lecture how to operate the crusher and we implemented awareness rising workshops in the Philippines. After that, the crushed lamps were imported in Japan and treated in Itomuka under the Basel Convention. Nomura Kosan imported and treated the Sari ton crushed lamps in 2017 and 13 ton in 2019. Next, please. I'd like to explain more about field surveys in the Philippines. We visited the government office in order to obtain the information on mercury management regulation in the Philippines. Especially, uh, we wanted to know the limits about mercury waste management, threshold about mercury waste, limits for disposal to landfill, workers' safety limits, limits of emission, and so on. And we asked them to let us know how much waste lamp could be generated in the Philippines. The quantity of mercury waste and regulation on mercury is important to develop the mercury waste management business. Also, we visited waste management companies landfill site and waste generators. We learn how they manage to market waste in their facility. Next, please. And we had in-country workshops in Manila and Cebu. The contents were awareness rising of mercury waste management and the announcement of start of fluorescent lamp processing business in the Philippines. Many of the participants were waste generators like factories, office buildings, and shopping malls. Regarding awareness rising, we invited Department of Environment and Natural Resources in the Philippines 
and sieve city and burn toxics as speakers. They had lectured on the importance of the mercury waste management, especially toxic of mercury, Minamata disease, and Minamata convention. And we invited local waste management company in Cebu. They installed our lamp crusher in their facility. In the workshop, they announced the start of a forest lamp processing business in the Philippines. Next, please. We had a training in Hokkaido in Japan. The de delegation from the Philippines who were government officers and private sectors visited Itomuka plant and Asahikawa city in Hokkaido. In Japan, municipality has responsibility on mercury waste management from household. In Asahikawa city, they run how correct and segregate ramps, batteries, thermometers, and swing manometers. In Itomuka, they run how to treat mercury waste. The site visit helped them understand how to treat mercury waste in Japan. Next, please. After the activities, Nomura Kosan developed sound management fluorescent lamps in the Philippines. Two waste management companies collect and crush lamps. The crushed lamps are exported to Japan. Nomura Kosan imports the lamps are trees, then in Itomoka plant in accordance with the Basel Convention. Next, please. The other example is Malaysia case. Department of Environment State of Penang in Malaysia asked us to develop sound management of la forest ramps in Penang. After that, Nomura Kosan applied a JICA fund in order to conduct surveys for sound management for ramps in Malaysia. JICA selected our proposal, and then we conducted surveys from 2015 to 2016. Next, management company private sector visited Osaka. The local waste management company was a candidate for installing ramp management facility. We invited Osaka and Kyoto city officers, and they had a lecture how they collect and segregate mercury waste from household. And the de delegation went to Kyoto city and visited collection points of mercury waste in Kyoto. And uh, UNEP IETC in Osaka, we invited the officer of UNEP IETC. He gave a lecture on Minamata Convention and Mercury Waste Management to the delegation. And they visited our Kansai factory of Nomura Kosan and learned how to treat ramps in Kansai factory. Next, please. After the survey, Nomura Kosan has the, and a local waste management company continue to discuss the installation of lamp treatment facility. But uh, the company prioritized e waste management business over fluorescent lamps treatment. So they thought that it was difficult to start lamp waste management, waste management business. And regarding the facility, Nomura Kosan was not able to find the grass carrot recycler in Malaysia. So we proposed a process which was crush and wash lamp in 
lamps in order to recover mercury contained in sludge. Disposed residue, including glass and metallic base in final landfill site in Malaysia. And export mercury containing sludge to Japan, according to the Model Convention, in order to recover the mercury in Itomoka plant. Our proposed facility has not been installed in Malaysia yet, but we keep the relationship with the stakeholders in Malaysia and try to make a contribute on mercury waste management in Malaysia. Next, please. Nomura Kosan uh, has a technology for mercury waste management, but it is difficult to disseminate the uh, mercury waste management technology all by ourselves. So the collaboration among stakeholders, like government, municipality, local, munis uh, local waste management companies, and waste generators and energy odes is important in order to disseminate sound mercury waste management. Nomura Kosan continues to disseminate mercury waste management for foreign countries with the local stakeholders. Next, please. Uh, this is the end of my presentation. Thank you for your kind attention. Um, thank you. Um... Uh, Iroki for the presentation. Great work done by uh, Mura Kosan Limited. There. We'll uh, go straight to the next presenter. We're almost running out of time, so we'll go to the. Hello, thank you, Maclet. I'll uh, I'll do my very best to to bring us Are back we... to to time. If you like, we can move to the next slide. Yes, sorry, Nick. I'll, 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 I'll. Okay, just a little bit of background about Batrek. Uh, Batrek is part of the Veolia Group. We're situated in, in central Switzerland, as you can see on the map. And we treat a number of different, different wastes containing mercury. Uh, and in fact, the, the story of Batrek started, as the name suggests, with the recycling of batteries. Uh, over 30 years ago. Uh, and then at that time, we encountered mercury within batteries, uh, and therefore we had to develop a, a method for safely separating and dealing with that mercury. So we installed a distillation facility at that time in order to, to separate and purify the mercury, which was then, at that time, recycled and reused. Uh, and since then, over the, over the 30 years, we've invested continuously at the site in order to develop new treatment solutions for different kinds of wastes, including those being generated from industries that we've already heard about, such as oil and gas, uh, chloralkali, uh, and also mercury, general mercury waste, such as thermometers and mercury containing articles. And today we have a, we have a full range of uh, treatment technologies that allows us to accept and treat a very wide range of wastes at the facility in Vimis. Um, but today I'm gonna, I'm gonna pick on the, the final step. I'm gonna look in a little bit more detail at stabilization. So if we move to the next slide. Um, and I think that the important thing is, what, what do we really mean by stabilization? Well, what we mean is the chemical transformation of mercury from its toxic elemental form into a non-toxic, extremely stable mercury sulfide form. So we, we're not talking about solidification, cementation, or any of the other spurious treatment uh, uh, methods that, that, that are sometimes mentioned, we're talking about true stabilization, meaning the chemical transformation of the liquid mercury. Uh, next slide, please. Um, and essentially, the stabilization is there because it's a requirement of, of the Minamata Convention to, to stabilize and permanently store mercury, there, thereby taking it out of the, the supply chain and taking it out of the environment and reducing the global risk of mercury. Um, so the stabilization is the is a absolutely critical part uh, of the um, solution uh, to the problems that are managed under the convention. Uh, next slide. 
Okay, we're dealing with lots of different kinds of wastes coming from the various industries that we've, we've heard already today, so I won't re repeat. Um, Chloralkali still produces waste during the decommissioning, and whilst much of Europe, Europe's stock has, has now been treated, there remains some stock in Europe uh, and also significant stocks, particularly in South America, where the decommissioning of chloralkaline facilities is only now starting um, and will be finished in the, in the, in the coming years. Um, gold mines, particularly industrial gold mines, produce significant quantities of mercury that has to be managed uh, in an environmentally sound manner. And there are also stockpiles of mercury that have been built up in countries where whilst mercury has been removed from the supply chain, it's not been treated and not been stabilized. Uh, you know, a good example is the, is the large stocks that are held in the United States. Um, but we're also seeing that clients and, and, and generators of, of waste that contains mercury are becoming more and more aware of their responsibilities and the risks. Uh, and so small volume uh, waste coming for treatment is becoming uh, an increasing demand for us. Next slide. So a uh, little bit about the, the BATREC stabilization process. It's, uh, it's carried at ambient temperature, ambient pressure um, in a closed loop system. So no emissions um, from an engineering point of view, rather, rather safe and easy to control. Um, and it involves the, the dosing of the liquid mercury with a polysulfide solution. And then in a, in a controlled reactor, the, the material is mixed um, and you get a precipitate, which can then be be removed using a, a, a filter press. So you end up with a, a low humidity uh, mercury sulfide, which goes for final treatment. Uh, and the polysulfide solution is, is recycled and reused within the closed loop system. So um, a relatively simple, very safe uh, and easy to operate, but a very, very smart solution. Next slide. And this has been developed in-house by Batrick uh, with the support of the R&D function of the, of the Veolia Group. Uh, and we have a patented process that, that, that allows us to, to stabilize material at, at our facility in Switzerland. Next slide. So the chemical uh, transformation means that uh, you know, we end up with a, a very, as you say, high density material, mercury sulfide. You see it there in the drum. It's a kind of uh, a pink colored um, powder, um, fine grain size, very low, humidi low humidity, very stable, very easy to, to handle and transport safely. Uh, and you see there that, um, you know, the metallic mercury at the left is, is well within the acceptance limits of the, the salt mine where the mercury sulfide is sent for final storage. Uh, next slide. Uh, and here you see just a, a quick photograph and a quick uh, schematic of what a salt mine is. Um, it's, it's a very deep, uh, very stable underground storage facility uh, where the material is placed into the caverns that are uh, formed when the, the, the rock salt is removed uh, during the mining process. Uh, very deep below the aquifer in very, very stable and safe geological conditions. Um, compared to, you know, a, a, let's say more conventional landfill, it offers a very very safe, long-term, stable solution uh, for, the, for the final storage of the mercury sulfide. Uh, next slide. Okay, but what's, what's key and what, what Batrick, uh, you know, particularly focus on, as well as the, the safe treatment, is to ensure that we've got a, a full traceability of the material. So all the way from the, from the waste generator, um, which may be in your chloralkaline facility, could be a mine in a remote location, to ensure that we've got complete documented tra you know, transport traceability up to arrival uh, at the Batrick site uh, under, under the Basel Convention shipment throughout the treatment, and then also including the onward transportation of the stabilized mercury sulfide to the salt mine. Uh, and what we offer and what we are able to provide at the client is a full mass balance. So the client is able, able to not only track and trace the movement of the waste, also to be able to demonstrate clearly that the full quantity of the mercury that was collected or, or generated by them is transformed to mercury sulfide and is sent for safe disposal and that there's no loss of material during any of the process. Next slide, please. Okay, I'm going to give you a couple of case studies, uh, one coming from the, the mining industry. Uh, and then a second coming from the chloralkali industry. Um, first one, gold mining. 
um, we're working with a, you know, one of the large industrial gold mining companies who are generating liquid mercury whilst they produce gold. Um, and we've heard that, you know, in, in, in an ideal world, perhaps, or, or in a world that we should work towards, um, each country would have its own treatment solutions for all its hazardous waste. But today that's clearly not the case. Um, and there are many countries who are many years away from that reality. Uh, and that means if you're a waste producer and you want to take a responsible approach to managing your waste, you're going to have to look at finding and perhaps developing your own solution uh, ahead of uh, self-sufficiency, which may come in, 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 in years ahead. Um, our client in this case uh, has a quantity of material. They have a, a need to deal with it in a, in a short time scale. Um, they want to focus on their core activity of producing gold. Uh, and so rather than go through perhaps a, a long and uncertain process of trying to bring in and license uh, an on-site treatment facility that would only be needed for a short period, they've, they've taken a, a different decision and they're looking to ship the waste to uh, a treatment plant that's already established, licensed and operating uh, in Switzerland. Um, and we've been able to help them with that. We, we provided you know, technical staff on site so that the handling and repacking is done safely and is controlled. Um, we are able to manage and help them to, to deal with the, the complexities of the Basel Convention uh, and the international transport of, of the, the liquid mercury uh, and ensure that the waste was safely moved, safely shipped and arrived at the plant in Vimis where it could be treated using our, our, uh, our stabilization process. Um, I think what, what, we, what we learned from, from this project um, was that you know you have to bring all the stakeholders together you have to work not only with the client but with the, the, the local focal point of Basel there has to be also an interaction with perhaps uh, transit country Basel authorities in order to ensure that the, the whole process is, is smooth and runs runs to, 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 to budget and to time um, it's an ongoing project um, we demonstrated that it, that it works well uh, and the challenge now will be to, to complete the the final disposal and, and meet the time scales that the client has um, which we're, we're aiming to do, certainly. Um, next slide. Here's a, another example, um, this time at a European level. Um, a former chloralkali facility, which was uh, undergoing a decontamination, decommissioning rather, and, and demolition. Again, we had a client here who had a fixed time scale, fixed quantity of waste, uh, and decided that, uh, as most chloralkali facilities have decided within Europe, to move their liquid mercury to a fixed treatment plant for, 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 for stabilization rather than to treat on site. Um, in this case, we, we worked with them to develop a, a plan that fitted with their decommissioning program, fitted with uh, the demolition program, uh, and we were able to transport and move waste uh, at times that suited the client and fitted with their program of works. Um, in this case, it was around 140 tons of, of liquid mercury that was left at the end of the operation. Uh, we transported that uh, to the facility in Vimis where it could be safely managed and, and stabilized uh, in, in, in full you know, compliance with, with the European regulation. Uh, and again, the ability to provide the client with full transparency, traceability, complete mass balance, allowed them to, to close out their responsibilities in terms of reporting uh, at a country level and in line with with, with the European requirements. Um, I mean, only two examples. Uh, I appreciate the time is short, but I think what, what I've tried to do is show that uh, there, are, there are different solutions available, but depending on the circumstances and the situation, you have to select the best solution for, for your situation. Um, On-site tr treatment will, will be appropriate in some cases. It will be transport and disposal at a fixed plant, which will work better in others. Uh, I think what, what, we, what we can show with Batrick is a, is a long-standing um, experience of dealing with mercury that's, that we've learned over, over 30 years of operation. Uh, and we can offer you know, a facility that, that's, that, that, that's operating at a very high standard um, that can be audited and, uh, uh, and inspected and you can see what's going on with the waste traceability 
uh, and demonstration of mass balance at the end of the project is, is for us as critical as the technical treatment aspect. Um, and I hope I've been able to at least share a little bit of our technology and, and quickly a little bit of our experience today. Uh, clearly, if you know if you have questions today or if you, you want to contact us in the future, we're, we're always open to, to try to help and to, and to offer assistance where we can. Uh, and in the next slide, yeah, you, have, uh, you have my contact details. So hopefully, I think I've brought us back close to time. Um, and I'm happy to have any questions through the chat. Thank you. Thank you so much, Nick. Sorry we didn't produce you, but um, I appreciate the skills. Now this has brought us to the end of the session, and I thank all the presenters, and I'll um, probably give back the this to back to the organizers. Should we have any questions? We are almost. Uh, Actually, this it's is eleven twenty-five. So, I'll end end it over to to uh, the host. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. So, I uh, see several uh, Q and A on the chat field, but maybe the time is coming. So, um, maybe we can respond for important questions later. Uh, then I will go to the. Yeah, so if you have any questions, please feel free to put in the chat field. But uh, at first, I want to invite the closing remarks. Um, so, uh, Rodgess Anklas, so United, United States Environmental Protection Agency, US EPA, uh, co chair of the Global Market Partnership Advisory Group. Um, thank you very much, Dr. Sari, and I wanted to start by saying thank you very much for this session. It's been particularly informative um, on this subject. It's been one that has been a challenge for a lot of people. I think um, there are three points that I thought would be important for us to, to go out with. One is wanted to express our appreciation to um, Dr. Sari and to the Government of Japan for your leadership on this. Um, I'm particularly pleased to hear that there is going to be some relationship between what's going on within the Basel uh, working group and with the work that you've done, because I think that's been, as you've noted, one of the challenges for a lot of countries of understanding how to approach this issue. I um, also wanted to give our thanks to the different presenters um, from Econ, from Nomura san and from Backtrack. Um, and highlighting the work that you've been doing in different areas. Um, and then the third item is I wanted to kind of recognize what some of the ongoing challenges are. The two that I noted was that the cross-boundary coordination issues are ones that I think are clearly ones that folks who are working in this area have identified and where we can work jointly together to help address them until such time as lo local solutions are widely available for the disposal. And then the second item in the same vein is once the mercury has been isolated, how does it, how is it stored in such a way that it doesn't return? I think a number of speakers have talked about the transition to mercury sulfide and that there are solutions such as shipping or as local, but kind of helping different parties understand what works best for them and how to do it will be another area where this um, effort can go. So I wanted to close by saying that one of the benefits of us being able to work together through the partnership is that we are very solutions-based and what has been presented today is very much focused on that as opposed to the discussions that take place under the convention. So we are very encouraged by this discussion and hope that over the next year, you're able to build further on the discussions that we had today. Um, but again, thank you for the interest from everyone. Very much look forward to some of the very interesting questions that I've seen in the chat, to having an opportunity to hear responses to those at a later date and to future, future discussions. Um, and to everyone wanted to wish a good morning or good evening or 
continuation with your day, depending on where you are. But thank you for your time and let me hand over to the Secretariat. Okay, thank you very much. And so sorry for our uh, time management. Uh, we can respond on time for the chat fields, can live. But yeah, uh, definitely we can respond uh, on the email or uh, website. Thank you very much all. So then uh, I want to hand over to Stephanie Sam. Thank you very much, uh, Ms. Suzu, and thank you uh, to all our dear panelists for the excellent presentations today. And uh, um, there are a number of questions in the chat, so do not hesitate to, to continue the, the discussion over the next uh, uh, minutes. And uh, we look forward to continue engaging with you all in the context of the partnership. Thank you. <laughs>